We bid each and every one of you welcome in the Saviour's name to our morning worship service today in Monoslain. Hymn number, or Psalm number 122, please. Psalm 122, you'll find in the Psalter section of your hymn book on page 120. Look at the first two words. I joyed when to the house of God go up, they said to me. I want to see a smile on your face. What joy, what pleasure, what privilege we have able to come to God's house in this manner today. Without, as one prayed in the prayer meeting, let our hindrance that we might come. I joyed when to the house of God, go up, they said to me, Jerusalem within thy gates, our feet shall standing be. We'll stand as we sing this lovely, well-known psalm, I, I trust, and it'll be to a well-known tune, the tune known as St. Paul's. Standing, please, as we sing the first six verses only, please. Standing, please, as we sing. That's good singing, words that remind us of the privilege that we have to be able to come into God's house in this manner. Let us still our hearts, please, as we wait before the Lord. Let us not come into his presence lightly today, but let us come in acknowledging who he is, the great, the high, the holy God, but yet the one who condescends to listen to our every request. One of the things, I'm often moved by this thought, one of the things that happened when Christ paid the ultimate price at Calvary was the very fact that the veil of the temple rent in twain from the top to the bottom, thus opening our way of access that we might come into the Holy of Holies. Let us reverently enter that place. Our Father, we do thank Thee this Sabbath morning that we are found yet again in Thy house. We well, thank Thee, Lord, that we're in the place where prayer is one to be made. We're in the place where already this morning the Sabbath school children have been taught. We're in the place this morning already where we've been able to have in that outer building, the new hall, a time of waiting before Thee. And Lord, we come into this morning worship service today in the sanctuary in the place that has been constructed and indeed maintained for all these years for the express, for the sole purpose of drawing Thy children together in this place that we might meet and worship Thee. And Lord, I pray that Thou would draw near in a very special way today. We long for Thy presence. We long for Thy voice. We long for Thy breath upon the nape of our neck. We long for Thy guidance, Thy direction, Thy still, small voice. 
And I pray, Lord, that I would speak through every part of the service today. We thank you, Lord, that we're able to sing the lovely hymns and indeed psalms that we have in our Psalter, in our hymn book, in the paraphrases. And Lord, I pray that I would draw near to each one of us today. Very often we as clergy will preach to the crowds in front of us, not knowing the particular need of the individual. But Lord, we thank thee that the one who takes thy word and the application of it knows every waiting heart. Not only knows, but knows intimately the need of each and every one of us today. And I pray, Lord, that thou might meet all at the very point of our need. Thou knowest the need of the preacher. Thou knowest the need of the one at the very back of the church and indeed every individual between. Lord, even we're mindful of those maybe watching along after the meeting is over online or listening from the village through the loudspeakers. And I pray, Lord, that Thou would speak today by Thy quickening voice, the voice that wakes the dead, And that I would bring many after thee today, men, women, and children, every category of sinner today. Lord, I pray that I would frustrate the evil one, the one that would attempt with all his trying and all his guise and all his tricks and tactics to steal away the good seed that is the word of God. I pray, Lord, that I would frustrate every attempt And Lord, that thou would drive thy word deep within our hearts, that we might not sin against thee. We pray for those perhaps today in the valley of decision, those that are strangers to grace and strangers to God, those perhaps that have sat under the sound of the preaching of God's word for decades, and yet this Sabbath morning finds them along with God's people, but not one of. God's people. Surely, Lord, in a congregation this size, there are those that are outside of thy grace and mercy as yet. But, Lord, I pray that thou would give that much-needed grace to call them to cry upon thee, even in the quietness of this meeting. Thou hast said, Be still and know that I am God. And we know, Lord, that the busyness of this world and the hectic pace of life for many in large part drives all time for thought of God to the side or to the back. But Lord, I pray that thou would even cause this day, the one day in seven, that it might be an opportunity for some. So Lord, bless today over every part of the meeting. We pray for thy guidance, thy superintendence. And I pray, Lord, that I would speak today in a way that will last long after the preacher's voice is silent. We're mindful of thy servant who would normally occupy this spot. We're mindful of the Reverend Henderson. We pray, Lord, that I would draw near to him, that I would give him the joy and the privilege of being able to come back again in thine own good time in the fullness of thy strength. Oh, Lord, undertake for us we pray for the Kirk Session, the Working Committee, the oversight of this church. we pray, Lord, for every Christian worker, for every praying saint of God. we pray that we, Lord, as a church, as a denomination, might surge forward in the only way that we can as God's people, and that is on our knees. We might not take new ground for Thee. Honestly, and might know blessing and experience Thy touch in these days, these days of spiritual darkness, when things seem to be crowding around us, pressure from every angle, every direction. I pray, Lord, that Thou would draw near and meet us at the very point of our need. So, Lord, bless us as we continue on in our praise and in our worship. Help us, Lord, as we sing the lovely hymns of Zion, even the very announcements today, that they might bring glory to Thy thrice holy name. In thy precious and holy name we do ask thee. Amen. 281, please, in your hymn book this time. 281. 
well known hymn, I'm sure. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Two yet one standing place as we sing. Standing place. There is a What a message, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The last word that we sang is the word free. In fact, we sang it every chorus, every time we sung a verse. We sung that chorus ending in the word free. I wonder, are you free from the bonds of sin today? You know the good news that I can tell you today on the authority of Scripture, that before you leave this meeting today, you can be free if you would but ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come in. At this stage of our meeting, I'm delighted to be able to ask your clerk of session, Billy Sturrett, to come just now, please, and to bring the necessary announcements. Thank you, brother. Let me first of all welcome you all to our worship service this morning in the Saviour's precious name. And if you're visiting with us, we bid you special welcome, trusting again that God will bless you as you worship here with us around the Word of God. We want to give a very special welcome to our visiting preacher today, the Reverend Paul Hanna. He's no stranger to us at all. Brother Paul, we welcome you in the Lord's name. And we trust God will bless you today and us 
through you as we hear the word of the Lord. The gospel service is at 7 p.m. this evening, preceded by the time of prayer at half past six. Announcements for the incoming week are as follows. The Wednesday night is the Bible study and prayer meeting at 8 p.m. And in the will of the Lord, the Reverend Gordon Ferguson will be conducting the prayer meeting. And then on Friday night is Youth Fellowship meeting night. There'll be no Youth Fellowship this weekend because it is the Presbytery meeting. So young people, you can remember that. Then the services are next Lord's Day. Usual time, Sabbath school and Bible class at 10.45. Morning worship is at 12 noon, preceded by the time of prayer at half past 11. And then the evening gospel service at 7, preceded by the time of prayer at half past 6. And the preacher next Lord's Day will be the Reverend Gordon Ferguson. This being the last Sunday in the month, it is the maintenance fund offering. Next Sunday will be the first Sunday in the month. That will be the missionary council offering. The committee meeting will be tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Do you remember that, uh, members of committee, please? And then additional reminders are as follows. The Easter convention services at the Murders Memorial Church on Friday the 7th of April, continuing on Saturday the 8th, and then on Monday the 10th. And the Friday night is the youth night. Saturday night is the missionary evening. So do please remember that those meetings, please. And also, the gospel mission plan for Sunday the 10th to Sunday the 24th of September here in the church hall. Do continue to pray for that upcoming event. And then we would ask you to continue to remember in your prayers, the Reverend Henderson, that the Lord will refresh him and strengthen him, strengthen him at this time. We know that he has been laid aside for a purpose, and it's difficult to rest. So we pray that you'll, you'll remember him in your prayers. And maybe some of you have been trying to get him and find it difficult to get him. Well, we would, we would ask you, please allow him this time to rest. We know that you're interested, but just get down at that time when you think you want to ring him, get down on your knee and ask that God would refresh him again, that God would bless him and that he may soon be back to a good measure of health and strength again. I know it's difficult for him not to answer a phone or because of his love for this congregation. So do please remember him at this time. Do continue to pray for the sick, the shut-ins and the bereaved, and also those that have been uh, are suffering the bereavement of late, and even maybe not so late, but they still feel the, 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 dif the difficulty in parting. So do continue to pray for them. And all these announcements are subject to the will and mind of the Lord. Many thanks to your clerk of session for the invitation to come along today and indeed for the words of welcome just given. And we certainly give a hearty amen to each of those announcements. Let us turn again, please, to our hymn books, number 553. I don't know if I've ever sung this one before or heard it sung, but I certainly know the words, love the words. And indeed, your organist has assured me that he does know it. There you go. There's Peter with a, a wry smile. Courage, brother, do not stumble. Today, we believe the Lord would have us consider Daniel chapter 3 and the stand those godly young men took when faced with utmost problems and really annihilation. Look at the words that are before us on page 399 in your hymn book. And I don't know how this is going to go. We'll see how we go. But certainly at the very least, we can take encouragement from the words of the hymn writer Norman MacLeod penned all those words ago, years ago. We'll stand and we'll try to sing it. I have no idea what the tune's even going to be. We want to find out just now. And we'll give it an attempt. But please do think of the words as we try. Look at verse 4. Some will hate thee, some will love thee, some will flatter, some will slight. Cease from man 
and look above thee. Trust in God and do the right. Think of the words as we sing them, 533, standing as we sing. Standing, please. Amen. What lovely words. Has anyone ever sung that one before? Two. Two hands. Three. Okay, well, three hands. Very good. Now, you could say, why are we singing something we don't really know? Is that not a bit crazy? Well, if we stuck to that rule, you would never learn new ones. And it's good to push ourselves a little bit. And certainly the words there are most encouraging Words that tie in so well with what we read even in the third chapter of Daniel. Turn to that portion, please, with me. Daniel chapter 3, please. One of the verses jumped out at me just as you were singing it so well uh, from that last hymn. Verse 3 speaks about perish policy and cunning. Policy. Things written down, things planned. We'll soon find that here in the third chapter of Daniel. I've been thinking a lot about, the, uh, about what we discover here over this past number of months. Daniel chapter 3. In fact, I was wondering, how are we going to cut any verses out of this chapter? It's quite a long chapter, 29, 30 verses within it. But maybe we'll read those verses. It would be good for us to take that little bit of time to do so. First... Uh, look at the progression here in this chapter. It starts off with the name, with the word, with the character, this huge character that was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, in my Bible here, it's given in block capitals. Such a huge figure as he was. The biggest figure, I suppose, in the world at that time, politically speaking. But you know how the Lord changed things around. And in fact, by the third, the, the, the very final verse of the third chapter, we read how the king, his name is alighted completely. He's just given the king, doesn't even say Nebuchadnezzar, the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. How the Lord stepped in and overruled. Let's read Daniel chapter 3, please. I trust you found the place now. Good to hear the rustle of Scripture. But that Russell has subsided. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold 
whose height was three score cubits. That's 30 yards high for those of us that think in yards. Three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. 30 yards high and three yards wide. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. There's the context. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent together together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the sheriffs, uh, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And then we've that list again in verse 3. When something is given to us in Scripture once, we ought to sit up and take notice. But if we have a repetition or a doubling, oh, how important it is. We're given that again. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces. Why is it given like that, do you think? To show us that everybody was expected to conform. Do we not see parallels with this? Between what we're going through even today and what we will go through in future days, I believe, how we're just expected to go along with things. Uh, let us read on. How all these individuals, these groups, these leaders were gathered together in the heart of verse 3, gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations and languages, that at that time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music. Ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And, here's the threat now. And, in fact, it's not just a threat, it's a promise. These things were going to happen. This is what will befall you if you don't conform with the crowd. That's what he's saying here. Verse 6, And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Everybody did what was expected of them. However, there were those that were the faithful remnant. Wherefore at that time, verse 8 tells us at that paragraph mark, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Now I believe, and we'll look at this later, I believe this had been a plan that they'd been waiting on and hatching and working on for some time. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever, look at the flatteries that are given. Thou, O king, hath made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, hark, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And now the venom starts to flow. Look at verse 11 or verse 12. There are certain Jews, you can nearly hear the hiss of the serpent here, the one who's trying to wipe out the very seed that Christ would come from, that messianic line. There are certain Jews who now set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're named, they're fingered, they're particularly isolated, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image that thou hast set up. They're making it personal. Then Nebuchadnezzar, and look at this, look at verse 13. You see, Scripture tells us as it is. It tells us here about the rage and fury. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image, which I have set up? See, it's still all about him. Now, if ye be ready, look at this. He's given them a second chance. He's given them another opportunity to 
recant, if you like. If ye be ready, at that time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. He's given them the second chance. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And, and he thinks he's asking a rhetorical question here that he knows the answer to. He thinks there's no answer to this question at the end of verse 15. And who... Is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? And his reasoning, nobody is able to deliver you from my hands. No God, no man, no beast. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had an answer. Do you see that? Do we have an answer today that though for those that would accuse us? Oh, they had an answer. Look at verse 16. They answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Oh, they give a very strong, a very direct, a very quick, a very black and white answer. If it be so, they're speaking to the king here, the most powerful in all the world at that time, most likely. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But it doesn't even end there. Verse 18 continues. But if not, if they're not delivered, Either way, no matter what happens, they're determined to remain faithful. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now in verse 13, we read about the rage and fury of Nebuchadnezzar. That's before he addressed these men. That's before he still had enough in him that he would give them a second chance. That now is blown. Look at what it tells us here in verse 19. This is a step up in his anger, if you like. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, not just in his rage and fury. Now he is, in the words of sacred scripture, full of fury. So much so, the evidence is given here in this next clause, that the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake, the second chance was now gone, Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then those men were bound in their coats, their hosen, their hats, and their other garments that didn't even take time to remove those garments, whatever they were wearing, they were bound in them. And at the end of verse 21, we're told, how they were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, remember, seven times more than normal, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then, Sometimes the Lord sends stuff into our path to stop us in our very tracks. Do you see the word astonied there at the start of verse 24? Then, it seemed to be very fast moving up until this pace, up until this point, up until this stage in what we read here in the third chapter of Daniel. But then, I love the word then in Scripture, it gives sequence. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished. He stopped in his very tracks when he saw and experienced what he, what he did next. And then he rose up in haste and he spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, lo, and lo is one of those words, a wee bit like behold and other words like that you'll find in the sacred page. Lo always comes before something really important. He's drawing their attention to something very important. Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt and, look at this, the last part of the verse, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye, see how he's turned about now and changed? Ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. You know, I often think about that. It just struck me. Again, just now as I'm reading it. How they didn't do what the ungodly king had asked them to do that was against all that they stood for. But this was a reasonable request from the same king, the lips from the same, the words from the same king, and yet they obeyed this reasonable request. They were commanded by the king at this point, come forth, and they did it. Verse 27 continues, and the princes and the governors and the captains and the king's counselors being gathered together, remember how they were all gathered together to witness how great Nebuchadnezzar was. Now they're in place that they might see how great the living and true God is. They were all gathered, being gathered together. There's no accident here. They saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. Nor was an, not even a hair of their head was singed. Neither was their coats chained, or the very smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Oh, he's changed now, isn't he? Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill. Because there is no, look at this for an admission, there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. He really here is answering his rhetorical question from the end of verse 15, where he asks, who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Thinking there's no answer. Well, now he gives that answer. Because there is no other God than Jehovah, the end of verse 29. No other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Amen. Uh, I know we've taken a bit of time to read all the verses, all 30. But I believe it's profitable for us even today to get a full sense of what's happening here in this chapter. Let us stand, please, for a second or two. Let us stand as we wait before the Lord in prayer before the preaching of His Word. Let us pray. Our Father, we do thank Thee today that we've got the liberty to be able to meet in this manner. Well, thank Lord, even in reading this chapter, and indeed our knowledge of history, of the times when the church weren't able to do so. But Lord, I pray that Thou would help us even as we might meet now at thy feet and in thy presence, as we might wait upon thee today, I pray, Lord, that thou would speak to us and speak with a voice that wakes the dead. Challenge us, encourage us, exhort us, Lord, even as we might take a stand in this evil and wicked day, even as these young men did back in that day. Bless us and help us, Lord, even in the remaining moments of this meeting. For thy glory alone we do plead. Amen. I want to draw your attention again, please, to the verses 17 and 18. The answer that these young men give against the charge from the most powerful man on the earth at that time. If it be so, they said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Now, that was going to happen either way. He was going to be delivered out of their hand, whether it was through being exalted into glory or whether it was the way the Lord had actually planned. That was going to happen. No matter what, they were determined to stand for God, no matter what the cost was going to be. You know, ladies and gentlemen, today, as I think about what we have around us today, and, in, and indeed the opportunities that we have in the gospel right now, there is no better time, in my reckoning, no better time than right now, the Sabbath day morning, to stop, to look back, 
and to consider our past. In fact, we've just celebrated the 72nd anniversary of the formation of the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster, just, just a few miles away from this very spot in the village of Cross Gar, on the 17th of March, 1951, this denomination came into being. So many years have elapsed. In fact, we're generations down the line now, but we ought to learn from the lessons that the past holds for us even today. And I have to be honest with you. I have to be honest with each and every one of you as I stand here with God's Word open before us, as I stand here knowing some of the history and knowing, in fact, some of the things that are happening across the world today, uh, as we think about all the tests and all the trials that the church of Jesus Christ has endured and indeed is enduring. And I believe that we're living in a time when we will experience more by way of challenges, more by way of pressure. In fact, we are living in a, in a time today when we are expected to conform to societal norms, demands that have been placed upon us probably more than ever before. Of late, there has been that constant ratcheting up of the pressure, ratcheting up of what we find here in Daniel chapter 3 especially, of doing what everybody else seems to be doing. This really to drink in exactly and all of what we're told. I've been thinking about the early chapters especially. Daniel's a wonderful book, you know. Uh, no, I'm not just saying that because of the prophetic lessons that were given here and, and all the eschatology that this contains, but especially in the first part of the book, we're given so much to teach us on how we ought to stand no matter what the cost, no matter what the pressure is upon us today. I believe that far too often, especially with the Old Testament, we'll have to admit this, but far too often we read the Word of God and, as I say, especially Old Testament Scriptures in an abstract kind of a way and we, we think it was somehow easier for those in the past to stand than what it is for us now. The devil is a sly old fox. The devil is one that would be constantly circling like the fox does, the chicken coop looking for a, a, a gate left open or a chink in the armor, somewhere where it might be able to slip in and, and to destroy, to kill. You know, it was no easier for these men. I trust as we take a little study of this and look at it, we'll see that, but it was no easier for what these men than what it would be for us to stand today. Apart from the fact, of course, that I believe in difficult times, in special times, in trying times, like our covenanting forefathers in the covenanting and the killing times, special grace is given. These men knew something of that special grace. In fact, think of the whole of the book of Daniel. Let's give a very brief synopsis of it, really. Judah had been sold into the hand of the enemy for her gross sin and immorality against God. She had been given over, sold into the captivity of the Babylonians, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar and his people because of gross sin, turning against God. Of course, in the earlier chapters, we're reading and thinking about chapter 3 particularly here. We don't have time to go into the earlier chapters, chapter 1 and 2. But in those earlier chapters, we we discover in reading between the lines especially and what's on the sacred page, especially chapter 1, about how the others that had been brought into captivity, many of the others, we believe, had went on that old mantra that's adopted by so many even Christians today, that old ungodly, unscriptural mantra of when in Rome do as the Romans. These men didn't do that. That's a non-scriptural notion. These men, Daniel and his contemporaries certainly did not do that. We read in the first chapter how Daniel and his three godly companions, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, were determined, even in the small things, determined to stand for the true God, no matter what their circumstances brought to them. The Lord blessed them in a most miraculous manner for the faithfulness, for the stand they took at that time, but that was to be but the first of many trials that were to come. I have no doubt that there are many in God's house today that have faced many trials in the past. 
I've no doubt of the stand that many of you have taken, and it is good for us to look back in our history. We've thought about that already, even from the start of this church and farther back to the start of our own denomination back in 51. But I believe that we will face many, many more trials in the days that lie before us before our race is run. And I challenge myself, even as I say this to a congregation today, will the Lord find me faithful? Will the Lord find us faithful as we're called to meet the many new challenges that this and indeed many other years will bring? I believe that we can learn from these men as they stood for God, were willing to and indeed did stand for God no matter what the cost would be for them personally. I thought this morning in the Bible class about C.T. Studd. That man who was willing, he felt led of God and he did it to give away his entire fortune that would be worth millions today in service for the master. These men stood for the Lord whenever everybody else dropped to their knees and groveled, no matter what the cost was. The first thing that I want us to think of today is very simple. It's simply this. It is the attack and we've hinted at this already, the attack that had been and the attack that was planned against them. Because I don't want you to be under any illusion today, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want you to be under any illusion today, young people. The devil, let me be clear in this. Look at me when I say this. This is so important for us to get a true grasp of. The devil is always on the prowl. He's always seeking whom he may devour. Let's learn from the experience of another. Think about Peter. Think about Peter in the Scriptures, and think about Peter in the Gospels, and how Peter denied the Lord on occasion. Oh, the Lord brought Peter through a lot. But every trial but proved to strengthen this man, and indeed from the storehouse of his own experience, as he wrote those epistles, in fact, his second epistle, he gives us this warning. He says this. In 2 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, be sober, be vigilant. Why? There's always a reason. Anytime we're instructed to do something in Scripture, we're always given the reason. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, that word, it's a big word, and it's a simple meaning. It means the one who constantly opposes us. Constantly tries to almost, we read of it and it just comes to mind about Hannah in the scriptures. Her, uh, his, her husband had two wives and the other wife is referred to as her adversary. The one who was constantly grinding her down. And we get a picture here of the devil's axe against the child of God, against the church, against the believer, against these young men that were seeking to be faithful against Peter from his own experience. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the one who opposes us, constantly day and night, always looking for a chink, always looking for a way in, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, seek, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, were to resist him steadfast in the faith. And that's what these men did. He always has on his agenda. He always has a purpose. He always has his eye out for some point of entry where he can get in, where he can spoil, where he can plunder, where he can get in through the back door or even a crack in the window. He's like that sly old fox circling the chicken coop, hoping someday the farmer will have left the gate open a jar where he can get in. You know, our enemy, the destroyer, waits patiently for souls whenever he's minding his attacks. You see, this book of Daniel, it, it doesn't, sometimes we read things like this and we just read through it and we think all these things happen in a very brief time period. It was just a, a quick, a sharp, a, an attack that, that, that was mounted over a, over a few, maybe even just a couple of years and then left at that. That's not the case at all. In fact, Daniel chapter 2, we're not going to go into it, we don't have time, but Daniel chapter 2 records a wonderful account of how these godly men of God could have been, humanly speaking, could have been completely obliterated before they even got started. And then, through all that happened at that time, the Lord actually 
caused him to be elevated in a miraculous way, especially Daniel, we have to admit. Daniel, the leader of the group, the Lord blessed him over and above the others and allowing him to sit in the king's gate above the others and giving him extra additional ability. He was able to stand, understand dreams and visions. But sometime, we, we really don't get a grasp of this just as we read chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. We don't get a grasp of this, but sometime had elapsed from the close of chapter 2 to the opening of chapter 3. In fact, when we go into it, and the Bible scholars help us in this, some 23 years, almost two and a half decades had passed before, between the events of chapter 3 and chapter 2. Considerable time. And during that time, I believe, and there's a lesson here for us spiritually today, because with the passing of time, sometimes our approach to things soften and changes. With the passing of time, the enemy had been watching. The enemy had been waiting. The enemy had been just waiting until conditions were just right in order for him to launch these attacks that would take God's servants down a peg or two. Or perhaps even wipe them out completely. What was he waiting for? Well, what do we find here? There's much contained. We read all 30 verses of chapter 3. There's much contained within this third chapter in the book of Daniel. But what's not here? What's not mentioned even once? What's not even or who isn't even alluded to even once throughout the 30 verses of this chapter? Not once do we read any reference to the leader of these young men to the man whom God had set up really above them with, we've mentioned that already, with those special abilities and that special place in the kingdom. Daniel isn't mentioned at all throughout this third chapter. And I want us to think about that. In fact, I genuinely fear today, in the church of Jesus Christ today, this is a thing that is widespread. Not only our own denomination, but right, right, widespread right across Christendom. Very often what we do today, what we tend to do today, is to allow everything to be done by the leaders of the work. We're so good at pointing the finger to others and say, they'll do it. There's no need for me to step up. They will do it. I was preaching not that long ago at a, at a conference, a missionary conference over in Oxford. And I've been thinking about this since because I asked the pastor over there, you know, about direction. What, what direction do you want me to go to? What, what do you want me to, to preach? Or what do you want me to emphasize here? Or just looking some general direction. And I'll never forget what he told me on the phone. Because I've thought about this really not much beforehand, but I've thought about it since, I can tell you that. He said this. He said, I want you to, to really put the emphasis on the people themselves, that we ourselves can be missionaries in our own area. We ourselves can stand for Christ no matter where we are, because we're living in a day and generation now when we're so happy to let others do the work. Let others, let the missionary societies reach the tray. He says, if you can at all, and he says, I don't want to tell you what to preach, but if you can at all, I want you to turn it around and to, to challenge the people in the pews. In fact, that's what was happening here. The enemy was waiting and waiting and waiting, 23 years, waiting and waiting and waiting for conditions to be just right. What condition? For Daniel to be offside. We don't know where Daniel was. Scholars reckon that he was perhaps away on some prime minister type business in some other part of the kingdom. He was certainly out of the picture completely whenever the enemy mounted their attack. They'd been waiting. They were waiting. Dr. Paisley often quipped about the support and the kind and the caliber of support that he had. And how people assured him of their prayers and their support and their help. And they would often say to him that we're behind you, Dr. Paisley. But then whenever he got into a fix, whenever he got into a battle, whenever he got to the very front, he turned around and they were so far behind, you couldn't even see them. We stood yesterday at the open air, the protest that marked the third anniversary of the introduction of abortion services to Northern Ireland. It was great 
that the oversight of the church, it was great that the ministerial brethren of the church, it was great that the government and morals committee of the church, it was great that the, the presbytery officers did not stand there alone. In fact, we reckon there were well over 300 people from across our denomination standing there. It takes all of us to move forward as one. These men stood together. Their leader was gone. Their leader was out of the equation. Their leader was out of their picture, out of the picture. But they were still determined to stand for the cause that they knew was right. Is there not still a cause today, ladies and gentlemen? Is there not something for us to stand for today? Does it not still grieve us today when somebody takes the Lord's name in vain? Does it not grieve us today whenever there's bad crack and uh, dirty jokes and all of that? Do these things not grieve us and annoy us today? Maybe as they used to. Do we take our stand for the Lord Jesus Christ whenever we can? Is there not still, remember David as he went to face the giant, is there not still, as he said, still a cause? I believe there's a cause today as much as there ever was. Just think of the nature of attack that came upon God's faithful few. That's what they were, just a few. There were others there who could have stood and should have stood, but it was really just these three men who, now they blended in as everybody was standing. Everybody was summoned to appear. Maybe they didn't know exactly why. They were all standing in that big plain of Dura. Uh, they looked up at this massive statue that was erected. They maybe didn't know all about it. And then the instruction was given. The warning was given. If you don't, you'll be burned. If you don't, you'll be cast into the fire. They didn't stand out at that point, but everybody else dropped. And then they stood out like a sore thumb. But they stood on because they knew what they were to stand for. What They knew the law of God. Way back earlier than Daniel, you'll find the book of Exodus, and in fact, you'll find Deuteronomy 5 as well, because it's there in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy 5 that we find the Ten Commandments laid out for us in black and white, and they knew it. They knew it. They knew that commandment that we read in Exodus 20, verse 1, the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. They were determined to stand for God, no matter what other thing would be put up, no matter what threat would be put up. For them, it was a black and white. For them, it was a clean-cut scenario. For them, they had no option other than to stand. They knew that they couldn't budge. They couldn't compromise. They knew that there was no way that if they were to bow a little bit, they would bow in all. They were 100% determined to stand and when they'd done all to stand. You know, we're told by Paul, as he writes those pastoral epistles to the churches in the New Testament, to individuals like you and I, as we're sat here, that were to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles is a very interesting word. The wiles of the devil, the crookedness of the devil, the subtlety, the attacks of the evil one. That's what these men were doing. In fact, Paul goes on in Ephesians 6, verse 13 and 14, he says to this, to the Christians. He says this to individuals such as you and I, therefore, wherefore, take on to you the whole armor of God. Why? that ye may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, verse 14, having your loins girt about with truth. They knew, they had the truth of God's word, of the commandments that were given afore their time, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. You know, we're under no illusion today. The Christian walk is, Right now, not will be tomorrow or some far-flung day in the future. Right now, the Christian walk is a real battleground. Don't we find that there in verse 12 of the reading? A real battleground. There are certain Jews who got the attack that was made. There are certain Jews who thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, this attack upon God's people. We're told many, many times that the Christian walk is likened to a fight or a battle. The Church of Jesus Christ used to be called the Church Militant. We don't hear that title so much now. 
more very often now, the church complacent or the church compromised or the church compromising, we ought to be those who stand for Christ and his principles. Just imagine the pressure. Just imagine for a moment if you were there. If you were one of these three men, just the pressure that they must have been under to conform. If up to verse 12 was bad, what must it have been like to have been hauled before the king in that 12th verse where they witnessed his wrath and his fury firsthand. But those men weren't going to budge an inch. They were determined that they would not crumble under the pressure that they would face that day. Rather, they spoke in direct and unequivocal black and white language as they nailed their colors to the mast of another. They stood before the king, the most powerful man on earth, and they nailed the colors to the mast of the Jehovah God, true servants of the God of heaven. Look what it tells us at the end of that 16th verse. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. What does that mean? I've often thought about that. What does that mean? Well, I asked my commentator friend, John Gill. I have him in my study, just ready whenever I need to ask him a question. What does that mean? Well, he put it into his own words. He said this, We have no need, this is his presse of the last part of that verse, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. We have no need to take time to consider this matter. In other words, we already know what our position is. We already know where we stand in these matters because we have it in God's word. And that ought to be our answer today in many of the things that, are, that come our way. That was the answer that was preached so faithfully by our moderator yesterday as we stood at the open air. He preached for half an hour on the subject of abortion and why it's wrong. Direct, clear, unequivocal language, black and white language. And many times throughout his message yesterday, he said, and I listened to every word, I stood right on his shoulder as he said it. He kept coming back to this book. He kept coming back to the Word of God. He kept coming back to that which is immovable. Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Coming back to that which is God breathed. Look what it says there as we continue on in Daniel 3, verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, verse 18, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods. In other words, regardless of their cost to them personally, regardless of what he would decide to do to them, they were determined to stand. The last time I was over in Scotland, we were over for the opening of a new church. And the last time we come back a bit earlier and we made at a point that we'd go to Wigtown. And we stood at the place where the two Margarets were murdered for the stand that they took. They were determined not to take the king's oath. The two Margarets, Margaret McLaughlin and Margaret Wilson, they stood for the Lord. In fact, there's a memorial there to that very purpose now. It was way back on the 11th of May, 1685. Are we determined to stand as they stood, the two Margarets, a young lady, an older lady? Are we determined to stand the way these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the way they stood, no matter what the cost would be for them? But you know, they didn't stand alone. We better move on. I see the time's moving on there. Not only the attack that was planned, but look at how the Lord was with them throughout thick and thin. The Lord was with them in the midst of that persecution. Look at verse 23, 24 particularly, and verse 25. They fell down bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then the king, and we did, we made highlight of this during the reading. We stopped at that point and talked about how he was, the king was stopped in his tracks on that occasion and how he rose up in haste then and he spake and said to his counselors because he saw it, he saw it. He saw the fact that these men were not alone. But before he even saw that, I believe, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I believe, I firmly believe that these three young men were most aware that the Lord was with them in the midst of that burning fiery furnace. It was only after that that this man actually witnessed, this ungodly king actually witnessed the fact that the Lord was with them in the midst of their persecution. 
And we must remember that, ladies and gentlemen. I talked earlier on, at the very start, in fact, we made reference to the fact that special grace was given. And the Lord does meet us at the very point of our need. The Lord does meet us exactly when. In fact, we're thinking this morning about C.T. Studd and how he gave away his entire fortune, 29,000 pounds as he was left in his father's will whenever he was just a young lad of, of 25, I think he was at that point. And that's millions in today's terms. He gave it all away. He kept a wee bit back and he gave it to his wife, who was from Lisburn, Priscilla. And he, he gave it to her as a, as a wedding present and not to be outdone. She gave it all away as well. And in fact, they were left penniless at much, for much of their ministry. But the Lord always met them at the point of their need. We highlighted, in fact, in that lecture this morning and how whenever it come time to, to send their children, their four girls, back to England for education, just the right amount of money come in at just the right time to be able to put them through the next stage of their education. Even whenever he went back again to Africa, he, he had just enough money given to him. He was given a sum of 10 pounds, which took him a part of his journey. Somebody gave him a bit more. It took him another part. Somebody gave him a bit more. It took him to another part. And every penny that was needed came in just when it was needed. The Lord meets us at the very point of our need. He didn't, he didn't deliver them from the fire beforehand, he delivered them in the fire. And there's a message there for us. I don't know what we'll face. But one thing I do know for certain is that the Lord will meet us at the very point of our need, no matter what it is that we will face. Will we stand? Are we determined? I have a wee saying that I'll often use. And I'll ask people, well, are you, are you wanting to do such and such? Are you going to do such and such? Are you going to... Uh, and they'll, they'll maybe make excuses and they'll say, well, such and such is on that night. And I, I'll stop them with a question. I'll say, well, do you want to go? Well, not really. Well, if you don't want to go and if you don't want to do it, well, that's it. That's the end of the matter. But if you do want to go where there's a will, there's a way. These men were determined to stand. They had the will and the desire to stand and God made it possible that they would. Are we this is a challenge to me more than anybody else, but it's a challenge each of us today as well. Are we determined to stand for God no matter what the cost is? Are we determined to stand for Him no matter what the outcome should be? Look at that verse where they said, but if not, verse 18, be it known unto thee, O king, no matter what will happen, no matter if God will deliver us out of the fiery furnace or if He will not deliver us, if we will but perish in the flames, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image that thou hast set up. Are we determined as those men were? Now, I believe the Lord gives special grace for special times. In fact, he has promised us. I love that verse in Hebrews 13, verse 5, I think it is, where he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. These men experienced that firsthand. In fact, the enemy the one that cast him there in the first place, experienced that through his own eyes. Now, I don't know where Nebuchadnezzar is today. I've thought about it actually over the last number of weeks. Where is he today? He was confronted that day. He saw with his own eyes, in fact, admitted it with his own tongue, that he saw the form of the fourth is like the Son of God, verse 25. What did he do with that knowledge? What did he do with that experience? You have been confronted so many times, I believe, with the claims of Christ today, yet perhaps there's some in this gathering that's still unsaved. Does the Lord have a plan and a purpose for you to come to him even this very Sabbath? You see, the, Lord, the Lord's providence was evident right throughout this chapter. In fact, before we even started to read it, as you're turning to the place, we highlighted the difference between verse 1 and verse 13. Verse 13 shows us how the king, throughout all that had happened, promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. The Lord put down his enemies, the children of God's enemies. Very often he'll do that. He'll put down his and our enemies, but he also promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon, as verse 30 tells us, for such a time as that. I believe the Lord has us in the positions and the place that we are today, and you will have people that you will meet. I firmly believe that. People that you will meet 
that your minister will never meet, that your session will never meet, that your Christian workers in the church will never meet, people that you'll be able to rub shoulders with, and that you can witness positively for the Lord Jesus Christ. But that starts when we take our stand. People will read us like a book. They'll never lift this book. They'll never lift Scripture. Very often people will set this book to the side and let it gather dust. But every day, every waking moment, they will read every... I had a child on my bus the other day and she said this to me. I, I actually had to ask her, what was that? She says this to me as we're driving down the road with a bus full of kids. She said, are you a Christian? I says, I couldn't just hear her right. I says, what was that? And she said it louder. I wanted everybody to ask. Are you a Christian? I said, I am indeed. Why do you ask that? Well, my daddy said that you were a Christian. Not a good one. People will read us like a book. People watch them, watch their lives. In fact, we read that right through. Look at chapter 5 and how they read them like a book. What will they, what will they find? What will they read when they read us as Christians today? I, I apologize for the way time has gone, but we trust the Lord will bless uh, these few stammering remarks in our midst today. I want us to sing just one verse, or maybe two, there's no chorus. We'll sing two verses of our closing hymn, which is, Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Oh, there's no, I, I forgot that. Every church you go to, some left offering, some don't. Uh, so this is our offering hymn at this point. Thanks for the reminder there, brother. We'll uh, remain seated, therefore, for the first part. 539 Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. that's good singing and what words of encouragement we have even in that hymn to stand up stand up for Jesus let us pray our father we do thank thee for thy word that we've been able to read even this morning together we realize that the God of this world why limited in his power and his authority still roams about still walketh about still seeks whom he may devour and Lord I pray that thou would give us strength of endurance, that thou would help us to stand in this evil day, having done all to stand. Bless, dear Father, in the work and witness of this church. Bless, dear Father, every believer that would come out to this thy house. But Lord, I pray particularly for those that are as yet strangers to grace and strangers to God. Lord, I pray 
that thou would take the scales of their eyes, that thou would help them, Lord, even as Nebuchadnezzar was able to see, able to see the Son of God, able to identify who it was, able to know who it was that was strengthening and enabling these three young men, these servants of the Most High. And Lord, I pray as others might read us as they try to do like a book, I pray that thou would bless and help and help us to stand and having done all to stand. Bless us now as we part, go before us. Bring us back in the will of the Lord for the gospel evening service tonight, the gospel hour. I pray for thy glory and thy glory alone. In thy precious and holy name we do ask. Amen.